You may have seen that story in the news about the bomb that was discovered in uh, Plymouth and they were able to safely take it away and detonate it out at sea. But that reminded me of another case about an unexploded World War II bomb. It was in Exeter and it raised some very interesting arguments about what we call causation. Um, and this is of general applicability, but to do the clickbait thing, I thought I'd just, you know, use it on the back of that story. So, by way of introduction, in 1942, the Luftwaffe were engaged in what they called the Bybacker Raids. Um, that's because they used a guidebook to England, the Bybacker Guidebook, and that gave them a list of sort of, you know, historic and interesting targets, and they literally just went through using that. And, just to go off at a tangent, um, for D-Day, they needed some really accurate maps um, of Europe. And it turned out that uh, somebody in American intelligence had a copy of the 1939 Michelin Guide to um, France. Uh, so US intelligence reproduced that guide in its entirety because it had really good maps in But of course, it also had all the restaurant reviews. I've been trying to get a copy because um, you see them floating around, but they're about two and a half thousand dollars um because there's not many left but they it's just the michelin guide but it says produced by u.s intelligence i mean michelin were really up to date they actually kept reviewing the restaurants all during the war and um, within a week of the e-day they produced their, their, their next guide but anyway so the germans uh, are bombing sort of you know interesting historical um cities including apparently um exeter and they dropped an s-1000 bomb uh, that was called the Hermann, after Hermann Goering, presumably because it was, you know, very, very large and round and not just because it was a sort of cross-dressing meth addict. Um, but it didn't go off and it laid buried in the ground. Um, and it was found um, a couple of years ago. And they sort of looked around, bomb disposal came out, what do we do with this? But the fuse had deteriorated so much they couldn't even tell what sort of fuse it was. Um, so they couldn't use their normal defusing techniques. Um, it was also decided that uh, the bomb was in such a condition that steaming out the explosives, which is another way of doing it, uh, just wasn't feasible. I mean, apparently they find like two to three of these a week. Uh, they just don't normally make the news. But this was a huge one. So they decided they had to detonate it in situ. The problem being, it was in the middle of a load of housing and it was right next to Exeter University's halls of residence. So when they did the controlled detonation, they pretty much took out the halls of residence. So Exeter University claimed on their insurance policy. Now what's interesting is their insurance policy with, with uh, Alliance, a German company. And what Alliance said is, ah, well, there is an exclusion clause here. We don't cover any damage, quotes, occasioned by war. So the question for the court was, um, was the damage to the halls of residence occasioned by war? Now, what the insurer said is, well, yes, it clearly is. This was dropped by the Luftwaffe. And you can't sue the existing Luftwaffe because they were very keen to point out that just because they've got the same name, it's very much been a rebrand. Um, but the university argued and said, no, no disrespect to the very brave bomb disposal people, but the damage was caused by the uh, detonation of the bomb. And that was done in peacetime, so it clearly wasn't uh, occasioned by war. Um, and they point a few sort of examples of cases. Now, one that um, the university relied on was a guy who was a journalist who'd been covering the Suez Crisis. But four days after the end of the crisis, when he was returning to Egypt, he was shot by the uh, border police. And that all went to court, and they said, well, no, because hostilities were over, at the time, officially, just because some people were trigger happy, that didn't mean that the death had been occasioned by war, so the insurance company had to pay out. But the insurance company relied on another case where um, there'd been a collision between some ships and the rescue ship had come and they'd sort of patched up the damaged ship and tried to tow it to safety. But in the end, it was decided that it just wasn't viable, that you know the patch wasn't working. So they, they ran it aground to just try and, you know, keep, at least keep it above water. And that obviously caused quite a lot of damage. Uh, but in that case, they said, well, the mere fact that somebody came in and tried to do something, but for the initial collision, they wouldn't have done that. 
So therefore, the blame lies with the owners of the ship that caused the initial collision, not the rescuers. Um, and this crops up quite a lot. Um, there's quite things like, say you injure somebody, you know, it's a minor injury, but they're taken to hospital and they suffer negligent uh, medical treatment, as a result of which they get a more serious injury, um, or, you know, the ultimate result. Whose fault is that? Well, the law says, actually, um, negligent medical treatment is a foreseeable consequence of causing an injury. So, but for you causing that injury, there wouldn't have been the risk of the uh, negligent medical treatment. So th that's blamed on you. However, if you cause a minor injury to somebody and as they're being taken to hospital in the ambulance, some reckless driver takes out the ambulance. They call that um, a novus actus interveniens, an intervening act. And that shifts the blame to the new person. Because they say, what, what's the proximate cause of the damage? What, you know, uh, and, and what they actually said in this case is they said, look, you know, metaphysicians and lawyers might look at causation in a sort of more esoteric theoretical way than the average person would. And they said, no, when we look at this, there's no great magic to it. What would your average person say was the cause of this? Uh, they would say, your average person would say the cause of this damage was the Luftwaffe dropping the bomb in the first place. Um, and that's what they held. So they actually found in favour of the insurance company. They said, yep, notwithstanding the fact that somebody came in and detonated the bomb, bomb disposal people having to get rid of bombs is a foreseeable consequence of dropping bombs in the first place. And therefore, this all basically it's all the fault of the Luftwaffe and the fact that it was 78 years later it doesn't matter um, the fact that you cause the harm and it takes a long time to crystallize you know you just go well but for and they said actually said they said the trouble with the but for test which is what we use a lot is it can just make everything but for you know but for you going out of the house this morning and going on the road and driving this accident wouldn't have happened i mean this does actually happen in um, traffic cases there's a new offense of uh, causing death by driving while not insured and the first person who got potted on that they accepted it was actually the other person's fault but they said but for you being on the road uninsured this accident wouldn't have happened because you wouldn't have given the other person the opportunity to be a reckless driver and crash into you um, that has been modified slightly now. They've said, well, actually, no, we need to look at, it's not just the mere fact that, you, you know, you're driving without insurance. We will look at whose fault the accident is. But if it's a, just, you know, a general crash, they will say, but for you, you shouldn't have been on the road in the first place because you're not insured. So, but for you driving illegally, this accident wouldn't have happened. So, you know, it is, it is you know, this idea of causation, how the law looks at it can be different to how lay people look at it. But in this particular case, they said, no, we'll, we'll, we'll adopt the lay person's test. So there you go. So yeah, um, the poor old university having to rebuild their halls at their own expense. Uh, but anyway, as always, hope you found that vaguely useful, vaguely interesting. Um, where am I today? I'm at Fioc Church, which is really, really pretty. Um, I'm losing the light a bit, a little bit, but uh, I'll try and catch some uh, views for you because it's lovely. Because just over there, behind the church, is the river, and also for some reason it has a separate bell tower because um, they wanted to get the bells very high, and this is on sloping ground. So being ever so practical, they said, "Why don't we just build the bell tower at the top of the slope and save all having to build the underneathy bit?" Very pragmatic.